So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and a very warm welcome to this 2024 ECB Money Market Conference. It's a privilege to have you all here, whether you're joining us in person or virtually. We were fully booked in person. Many more people are waiting actually in the entrance. Uh, and we will have four, 400 more people connected online. This underscores the critical importance uh, that money markets have gained for market functioning, for monetary policy implementation, and for monetary policy transmission. The distinctive feature of the, this conference is that it brings together academic uh, market participants and central bank practitioners. And I'm very honored to have here today with us uh, a number of head of markets uh, from major uh, central banks. The uh, lineup that we have uh, assembled, I think, for this conference is very uh, impressive, with a number of high profile speakers who will focus, among other topics, on the transition towards a new environment with lower levels of central bank reserves and on changes to central bank operational frameworks. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items to make sure that your conference is smooth and productive. First of all, we will have to comply strictly with the timing because uh, of the online participation um, where uh, the, the different sessions have to start and to end on time. Second, you can find the agenda of the conference on our website if you need it, or there's also a QR code uh, displayed uh, on the poster in the lobby here. Then, I'd like to invite you uh, to participate actively in every Q&A that will take place after the academic sessions, after some of the keynote speeches, after the market panel, um, because these discussions, as I was saying, bef between academics, uh, market participants, and central bank practitioners bring a lot to this conference and a lot of its value added. Then, of course, these discussions uh, among these three groups of people uh, can also take place during uh, the multiple breaks that we have scheduled in the conference for networking. And so the first one will take place at 11 today. But importantly, there is one break that is more important uh, than the others, both in terms of time allocated, but also in terms of content. And that's the break at 3.30 today, where we will have poster sessions. And you see already at the back over there uh, these posters uh, that feature analytical work on money markets conducted at the ECB, and the authors of um, these analytical work will be available for discussion. So please uh, don't hesitate, be, um, be there, uh, be active, um, and, and uh, discuss with them and ask questions. Then uh, lunch, we will stop for lunch at uh, 10 minutes past one. That's a buffet lunch. Uh, we, we are quite numerous here, so please make sure that you, know, you proceed relatively swiftly. And most importantly, that you are back in the room at uh, 2.30 sharp to listen to the keynote speech of Daryl, Daryl Duffy. Then um, the conference today will conclude at 6 o'clock. Uh, at that point, you are warmly invited uh, to stay for another hour to share a glass of wine or um, anything else with us, yeah? And then we would have, uh, at 7 o'clock, approximately a dinner for a small group of invited guests who have received a prior invitation. Importantly, when you leave the building tonight, Please give back your ECB visitor badge that you received uh, this morning at the entrance, because tomorrow it's a new badge, okay? So don't keep it, give it back, and tomorrow you have to take another one. Tomorrow, we start again at uh, 9 o'clock sharp. Again, uh, be punctual to uh, listen to the speech uh, by Antoine, Antoine Martin, Vice Chair of the Governing Board of the Swiss National Bank. 
And uh, the conference will uh, conclude tomorrow with uh, the market panel that will start at 10 minutes past 12 and finish punctually, I hope, at 15 minutes past 1 and conclude uh, the conference. We will also have a lunch um, uh, that is basically organized tomorrow after the conference. So thank you. Thank you once again uh, for joining us today at uh, this, this morning market conference. Uh, we trust that uh, the program that we have assembled uh, for you today, which is very varied, as I said, economic, uh, academic sessions, um, keynote speeches, and the market panel. We trust that this blend uh, will be both informative and uh, thought-provoking. And um, now, let's get started with one of the highlights uh, of the conference, I'm sure, for all of you. And uh, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Isabel, Isabel Schnabel, member of the executive board of the European Central Bank, to open the conference. And it, Isabel, you start with, uh, I think, a fascinating speech on the interim assessment of the ECB balance sheet uh, reduction. So without further ado, Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, everybody. Let me join Iman in welcoming you to uh, this year's Money Market Conference. Once again, as already mentioned by Iman, the lineup of papers, discussants, and speakers is impressive. So uh, thanks uh, to the entire team for setting this up. Uh, and I'm looking forward to two days of rich and insightful discussions uh, about money markets. At the time of this conference, a year ago, the reduction of the ECB balance sheet was already in full motion, mostly as banks repaid the loans they had taken up under TLTRO 3. Since then, the phasing out of bond reinvestments maturing under our monetary policy portfolios has increasingly contributed to the decline in excess liquidity in the euro area. As of January 2025, the euro system will no longer reinvest any of its monetary policy bond holdings, leading to a runoff in our portfolios of around 40 billion euros per month. As a result, and you can see this on my first slide, excess liquidity is projected to decline significantly from just about 3 trillion euros today to below 2 trillion euros by the end of 2026, but will remain ample for some time from a historical perspective. The ECB is closely monitoring the impact of the decline in excess liquidity on financial markets, the banking system, and the economy at large to assess how these developments are affected by the changes to our operational framework that we announced earlier this year. In my remarks, I would like to take stock of where we stand today. My main message is that while excess liquidity is remaining ample, the ECB's balance sheet reduction is progressing smoothly and has helped improve market functioning with clear signs of increased market activity and a redistribution of reserves across banks and borders. Historical episodes of central banks reducing the size of their balance sheet, let alone by significant amounts, have been rare. As excess liquidity declines, there is significant uncertainty about how much reserves banks want to ultimately hold in the long run as well as about the capacity of money markets to efficiently distribute excess liquidity across the euro area. If banks wish to hold a higher level of excess reserves, for example due to stricter prudential regulation, the projected decline in excess liquidity might put upward pressure on money market rates earlier than suggested by historical regularities. To cater for this uncertainty, the Governing Council in March decided on changes to the ECB's operational framework for implementing monetary policy, which is summarized on this slide. 
The framework has three main characteristics. The first is that it is a demand-driven system, meaning that the marginal unit of reserves is provided elastically on demand through our standard refinancing operations and against a broad set of collateral. A demand-driven system allows banks to hold the level of reserves that they find optimal and assure, ensures against risks of fragmentation and sudden liquidity imbalances as reserves become less ample. This requires banks, and this is important, to regard access to our standard refinancing operations as an integral part of their liquidity management without any stigma attached while retaining a diversified funding mix. The second key characteristic of our framework is the mix of instruments used to supply reserves. Our short-term short refinancing operations are at the center of liquidity provision. At a later stage, we will gradually complement them with new structural longer-term lending operations and a new structural bond portfolio taking into account legacy bond holdings. Both will provide a more stable source of liquidity to reflect the economy's growing currency demand. The third key characteristic is that monetary policy is implemented through a soft floor with a narrow spread. As reserves become less ample, Money market uh, rates could rise relative to the deposit facility rate, which is the rate which we steer our monetary policy stands, and could potentially become too volatile. In view of this, on the 18th of September, the spread between the rate on the main refinancing operations and the DFR was reduced from 50 basis points to 15 basis points. This historically narrow spread limits both the scope for upward pressure on money market rates and their volatility, and it sets incentives for banks to borrow liquidity in our operations as our balance sheet normalizes. In this context, a soft floor means that the governing council will tolerate deviations from the DFR in both directions provided that such movements do not blur the signal about the intended monetary policy stance. At the same time, the reduced spread is still large enough to preserve incentives for banks to find market-based funding solutions to ensure themselves against liquidity shocks, thereby avoiding the risk of excessive liquidity transformation through the euro system balance sheet. Clarity on the operational framework has helped banks and financial markets more broadly prepare for a period with less ample reserves. Since we announced the changes to our framework in March, further significant balance sheet reduction has taken place. This reduction has been progressing smoothly, and many of the concerns of the potential impact of the decline in our balance sheet on the economy have not materialized. This is illustrated by three developments. First, the phasing out of reinvestments by the euro system has not led to any bottlenecks in the absorption of bonds so far, in spite of increased net issuance by governments. The left-hand chart on this slide shows that foreign investors, shown in purple, have been absorbing the largest share of the net issuance of bonds in the euro area since the euro system ended its reinvestments of securities under the APP with households also playing an important role in some economies, especially in Italy, and households are in green in the chart. Second, we have not seen an excessive rise in long-term interest rates. The right-hand side chart illustrates that while the term premium, this is the yellow bar, initially increased from historically unprecedented negative territory, it has recently fallen again and stabilized at low levels. The fact that the impact on the term premium has been contained reflects the gradual and transparent approach central banks have taken when reducing their balance sheets. This gradualism is probably one reason why announcements of quantitative tightening are often found to have smaller effects on bond prices than announcements of quantitative easing. Third, subdued credit growth 
over the past two years cannot be attributed to the reduction in excess liquidity and in our monetary policy bond portfolios in particular. Instead, it has been by and large the result of weak loan demand and higher interest rates. According to our most recent bank lending survey, 95% of banks reported that the ECB's monetary policy asset portfolio had no impact on their lending volumes to firms over the past six months. 96% of banks expect this to remain the case over the next six months. That is, banks do not mechanically make their lending decisions dependent on the level of excess liquidity, with base money multiplying into broad money. The decline in excess liquidity may even contribute to higher rather than lower credit growth. New evidence for the United States suggests that reserves injected during quantitative easing crowded out bank lending, possibly because regulation has made bank balance sheet capacity costly. So, in many areas, balance sheet reduction has not left any significant footprint, at least so far. But in other areas, especially in the euro area money market, the ongoing decline of excess liquidity is starting to leave some traces on activity and prices. And I would now like to explain what these traces are and what they imply for monetary policy and the likely future evolution of money market rates. In a demand-driven system, Gauging the ampleness of reserves is not necessary for informing the process of quantitative tightening, which is running steadily and predictably in the background. The reason is that in contrast to a supply-driven system, our framework does not require estimating the volume of reserves necessary to steer short-term money market rates towards the steering rate. In the euro area, the narrow corridor ensures that overnight rates will remain close to the DFR. But it matters for the implementation of our monetary policy how the decline in excess liquidity affects the take-up in our standard refinancing operations, how it shapes the distribution of reserve holdings across the euro area, and how it influences the rates at which banks borrow in money markets. We have therefore developed a comprehensive monitoring toolbox to allow us to understand how banks adapt to the decline in excess liquidity and whether this process may eventually require changes to our operational framework. A review of the key parameters of the operational framework is scheduled for 2026. Based on this analysis, I would like to discuss three developments that have emerged over the course of this year. The first development relates to a steady and measurable rise in secured money market rates in the euro area and beyond. You can see this on the left-hand side of this slide. While in some parts of the world repo rates are already trading above the main policy rate or have temporarily drifted outside of the target range, in the euro area the repo funds rate is now trading broadly at the level of the DFR. The right-hand chart shows that within the euro area, repo rates have also converged across collateral classes. Over the past years, transactions secured by German uh, government collateral in particular were trading at a significant premium over others. This premium has declined considerably. The increase in repo rates could result from two factors higher collateral availability, and lower excess liquidity. Depending on which factor dominates, the implications for monetary policy would differ. One of the main conclusions of our monitoring work is that it was primarily the reversal of collateral scarcity that was driving repo rates higher. Between 2021 and 2023, the ECB's large bond holdings and the significant take-up in our TLTROs resulted in a sharp decline in the collateral available for secured lending. Collateral scarcity, in turn, caused repo rates to drop sharply. The left-hand chart of this slide shows that, at the peak, in late 2022, more than 70% of repos were trading at least 30 basis points below the DFR. 
Repos against German collateral temporarily traded more than 100 basis points below the DFR. Collateral availability has improved significantly over the past 18 months. Large issuance by euro area sovereigns was an important factor. But the right-hand chart illustrates that the decline in the euro system's market footprint contributed measurably to easing the strains in repo markets and thus to the gradual normalization of repo rates from extreme conditions. The question is whether the rise in repo rates will continue. Any answer to this question is inherently speculative. But for as long as there, uh, there is ample excess liquidity, it is likely that repo rates will stay in the vicinity of the DFR as banks would be expected to lend reserves in the repo market if there were persistent gains to be made there as opposed to depositing these reserves with the ECB. The left-hand chart of this slide shows that for now the DFR is indeed anchoring one-day repo rates. The right-hand chart illustrates why still today most Eurosystem counterparties have excess liquidity several times larger than their minimum reserve requirements, especially the larger ones. The extent to which markets can mitigate upward pressure on repo rates critically depends on market participants taking advantage of arbitrage opportunities arising from the spread between money market rates and the DFR. And this includes banks' willingness to lend reserves across borders. As the left-hand chart of my slide shows, the distribution of excess liquidity holdings is highly uneven across countries. So, on reporting dates or at lower levels of excess liquidity, repo rates could rise above the DFR. This may happen, for example, if banks start to refrain from lending reserves in money markets, for instance, to keep their regulatory liquidity ratios above a certain threshold. Such intermediation constraints may help explain the premium that we are seeing today for repo transaction cover, uh, transactions covering the year end, even for the most liquid collateral, as is shown in the right hand side. So these are the green bubbles. High price markups often reflect trades with non banks that have no access to our lending facilities. This brings me to the second development. As excess liquidity has declined, we have seen a notable pickup in market-based funding activity, which has also contributed to reserves circulating from banks with abundant liquidity to those with less liquidity. The left-hand chart of my slide shows that repo volumes of transactions between euro area counterparties have grown by nearly 25% since excess liquidity started to decline, with the strongest growth seen for cross-border transactions. The right-hand chart shows that with the repayment of the TLTROs, we have also seen a considerable, a considerable rise in liquidity-motivated transactions, which now seem to have stabilized at a comparatively high level. The issuance of bank bonds has also played an important role in providing market-based funding and in redistributing reserves. The left-hand chart of this slide shows that, since 2022, banks have issued a record amount of covered and senior unsecured bonds to substitute maturing TLTRO funding with several issuers returning to the market after a long absence. For covered bonds, last year saw a record number of issuers tapping this market, including a variety of small-sized issuers. Banks were major investors in the covered bonds issued by other banks. The right-hand side chart shows that from 2022 to mid-2024, banks absorbed the lion's share of the net issuance of covered bonds. This is the yellow bar. My next slide illustrates that cross-border transactions played an important part in this. The left-hand chart shows, for example, that German banks invested considerably in covered bonds issued by banks in other countries. These cross-border flows suggest that there are no signs of fragmentation. So does the fact that changes in target two balances reflecting these cross-border flows have measurably contributed to recent changes in excess liquidity. 
The right-hand chart shows, for example, that in Italy, large target two inflows, the green bar, offset a significant part of the decline in excess liquidity related to the repayments of the TLTRO3, the purple bar. In reserve-rich countries, the opposite effect has prevailed. The smooth redistribution of reserves is another indication that Eurosystem excess liquidity remains ample. And it is likely to have reduced the need of banks to use the ECB's standard refinancing operations. As this slide shows, the take-up of our operations remains very low. And it did not materially increase after we reduced the spread between the rate on the MROs and the DFR to 15 basis points. One reason is that in most cases, funding via market-based sources remains more attractive than the recourse to ECB operations, even with a narrower spread. The left-hand chart shows that currently, borrowing from the ECB may be more economical only for some non-HQLA collateral. In addition, we are seeing that banks are willing to reduce the share of reserves in the holdings of HQLA. The right-hand chart shows that this share fell from a peak of 78% in late 2022 to 56% today. As the aggregate LCR has stabilized around 160% over the past two years, banks have started to substitute reserves for other HQLA. Yet, as excess liquidity declines further, we expect more and more banks to tap our liquidity providing operations, also because a substantial share of euro area banks are currently not active in repo markets. Borrowing in the unsecured market could, in principle, be an alternative for these banks, especially because sourcing liquidity via unsecured trades has become cheaper compared with secure trades in the repo market since the middle of last year. This slide shows that while repo rates have trended upwards, Euro STR, the Euro area's benchmark rate representing banks' overnight unsecured borrowing conditions, has barely budged. The stickiness of Euro STR is the third development I would like to discuss today. The unsecured segment of the Euro area money market is special in two respects. First, banks are rarely on the lending side, mostly for regulatory reasons, as the Basel III reforms treat secured lending preferentially. From a borrower's perspective, too, secured lending is more attractive than unsecured, as leverage ratio costs can be significantly mitigated by netting lending and borrowing through CCP clearing in the secured market. As a result, the unsecured market is primarily used by banks to intermediate deposits from non-banks without access to the ECB's balance sheet. The blue column on the right side shows that since 2022, an average of around 85% of the volume of trades have had non-banks as a counterparty, especially money market funds. Since this intermediation service carries the cost of balance sheet expansion through the leverage ratio, banks typically demand a spread relative to the DFR to compensate them for binding their balance sheet capacity. Second, trades in the unsecured money market are typically relationship-based. The left-hand side chart of this slide shows that around 80% of Euro STR trading volumes come from depositor bank relationships that are regular or stable, that is, they are active almost every day. Relationship trading has important implications for the pricing of the trade. Specifically, banks impose higher intermediation fees on customers that come only sporadically and are less predictable. The right-hand chart shows empirical evidence suggesting that banks reduce the extent of regulatory cost pass-through to their most stable clients by 2.4 basis points for taking an unsecured uh, deposit. Uh, such discounts are economically significant and can in part be explained by banks' ability to profit from cross-selling other more lucrative business to their stable depositors. So, the microstructure of the unsecured money market is consistent with the weak responsiveness of Euro SDR to changes in excess liquidity. The question is whether and to what extent this will change as excess liquidity declines further. There are two sides to this. On the one hand, as many smaller banks do not have access to the repo market, 
they may start competing for liquidity in the unsecured market once borrowing needs become more imminent. Increased competition could put upward pressure on euro SDR. On the other hand, lenders in the unsecured market seem price insensitive. As repo rates trade well above euro SDR, lenders should have an incentive to place their cash in the repo market. However, so far, there has been little migration across the two segments. The left-hand chart of my last slide shows that this may predominantly be because most lenders that are active in the unsecured market, the red bar, do not have access to repo markets. Moreover, those um, uh, that have a more diversified liquidity management may find it difficult to lend excess cash in secured markets. One reason is that these operate mainly in the morning hours, as the right-hand chart shows. Money market funds, however, allow redemption notices until 2 p.m. and need to preserve liquidity to meet any potential outflows until then. Unsecured markets may thus be the only viable option for them to place liquidity in the afternoon. And this suggests that banks are likely to maintain some pricing power in this market, keeping the sensitivity of euro SDR to changes in excess liquidity more muted. Overall, it is uncertain which channel will dominate. It is therefore too early to assess whether euro SDR is an appropriate indicator of reserve scarcity. Its resilience so far may simply suggest that reserves remain ample. But should the gap between repo rates and euro SDR continue to widen as excess liquidity declines, it will be necessary to assess how this affects the transmission of monetary policy to the real economy. All in all, and with this I would like to conclude, our analysis suggests that excess liquidity remains ample in the euro area. Recent upward pressure on rates in some segments of the money market reflects, by and large, a reduction in collateral scarcity due to increased bond issuance by governments and the reduced euro system market footprint. The improved availability of collateral has helped to significantly improve market functioning in the euro area. In addition, increasing market-based funding activity and growing signs of redistribution of reserves across banks and borders suggest that banks have started adapting to an environment with less ample reserves. We expect this process to continue as excess liquidity declines further, with banks increasingly sourcing liquidity through our standard refinancing operations, as these constitute an integral part of a smooth implementation of monetary policy in our operational framework. Thank you very much for your attention.